Chair uh, Ganchen to introduce the first uh, speaker. Okay, thank you, Asen. Um, it's really my pleasure to uh, co-chair this session with uh, Dr. Asen Latif, who is the Director of the Vial Control of the Union. So, uh, as he said, uh, the theme of uh, this session is really about uh, China tobacco, but it's really not about China tobacco in China, but China tobacco in other countries, uh, doing business and policy interference and other things. So we've got um, five uh, very exciting presentations. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce the first speaker. Um, our first spe speaker is um, um, Jennifer Fong, and she's from the um, uh, Simon Fraser University um, from Canada, and she's a project coordinator and research fellow in global tobacco control. So uh, Jennifer just published a very good paper on this topic very recently, and that's why we invited her to give a talk on this paper and um, on this subject. Jennifer? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jennifer, and I'm based at the Simon Fraser University in Canada. Um, as Dr. Gan just, oops, I'm doing something wrong. Okay, so as Dr. Gan just introduced, uh, we published this paper recently, and uh, we were interested in looking at CNTC, not just a domestic focused uh, corporation, but also globally, uh, because we were seeing evidence of them globalizing. So just to introduce China Tobacco, um, they are, China is the largest consumer and producer of cigarettes, and CNTC contributes to about 7 uh, to 11% of national government revenue every year. Its process, process, profits exceed that of VAT, PMI, and Altria combined, but there's been very limited analysis to date. So what we were interested in looking is uh, why CNTC is trying to globalize, um, what are the, some of the strategies it's using to globalize, and how globalized it is to date. So we use Chinese and English sources. Uh, for example, Google Scholar, Baidu Scholar, and um, a variety of industry websites, including China Tobacco Yearbook, which is their publication that comes out more or less every year. Um, we did triangulation through media so reports and also relied on external business sources such as Euromonitor, um, Tobacco Journal International, and Tobacco Reporter. Uh, with the data we gathered, there are some major limitations. For example, because CNTC is not a public company, it's not obliged to publish a lot of its information. Um, secondly, because it's government controlled, uh, it's really impossible to obtain some of the data they quote in other places, so we can only rely on those. And thirdly, th we notice inconsistencies in data across various sources. So we found that uh, there are three main factors for CNTC to globalize. First of all, it was uh, China's accession to the World Trade Organization in 2001, um, and China had to decrease its import tariffs. So import of foreign cigarettes rose dramatically, and the industry was fearful of this uh, potential market encroachment. Um, secondly, the WHO's Framework Convention, Convention of Tobacco Control went into effect in China, and uh, again, the industry was fearful that um, this would lead to more stringent tobacco control efforts and legislation, and which would eventually uh, decrease tobacco consumption. And thirdly, even though the market is huge, it was becoming pretty saturated, so there was limited uh, scope for expansion. And from a business ex uh, perspective, there are four incentives for CNTC to globalize. Well, firstly, it's a natural resource seeker where it seeks to import better quality raw materials such as tobacco leaf from Brazil, from the United States, from um, Zimbabwe. Secondly, it's a market seeker where it ex in ex uh, expands exports to increase its uh, global market reach. Thirdly, it's an efficiency seeker where it seeks to establish key um, operations in key geographic uh, locations for better efficiency. And lastly, it's also a strategic asset seeker where it monitors the global, mar global cigarette market for investment and business growth. So some of the, fact some of the strategies that the uh, China Tobacco used to globalize, to prepare for globalization include restructuring of the domestic industry, um, and this was done, first of all, through consolidating the, domestic, n the number of domestic cigarette companies. So the um, industry was really fragmented and really chaotic with a number of factories producing a huge number of uh, brands. So the industry 
started to uh, consolidate its factories by closing down small factories and merging the medium size into bigger ones and slapping on the big successful ones with uh, favorable policies to encourage them to grow bigger and to globalize. So as you can see from the graph, the number of factories went from 185 in 1998 to only 31 in 2009. And secondly, um, the vertical bureaucracy was restructured. So at the central level, we still have the uh, tobacco company and the monopoly administration, STMA. And on the provincial uh, level, the distribution and the manufacturing of cigarettes was separated. So provincial industrial companies are responsible for manufacturing only. They do not have rights to sell. And provincial tobacco companies, which are also the monopoly offices at the provincial level, they are only responsible for distribution and sell. So um, in this way, the former vertical bureaucracy was restru restru restructured. So um, you have the CNTC as the parent company. On the second level, we've got provincial tobacco companies as the daughter companies. And they, in turn, have subsidiaries as well. So those are either municipal tobacco companies with legal authority who are subsidiaries, or they are municipal tobacco companies acting as branches because they do not have legal authority. The second strategy is product development, which includes brand consolidation. Um, because, again, because of the number of tobacco companies, uh, the number of brands produced was also huge. So from a business point of view, this is really problematic because of low levels of consumer loyalty. So, and CNTC wanted really to groom several flagship brands uh, that, it could, that could compete on the international market, for example, with Marlboro or Camels or any other popular brands. So um, the industry took steps to consolidate its brands, for example, by phasing out um, slow selling, not very successful brands, and by uh, putting a limit on the number of brands that could be produced uh, on, on during any given year. So the number of brands went down from 2000 uh, in about 1990s to only 90 brands in 2013. And this brand consolidation not only took place domestically, but also globally. So in 2013, there were um, 74 brands sold national, uh, globally, and this number went down to only 30 in 2014. And the second strategy used for product development is uh, premium premiumization, where uh, the, this goal is um, to have to increase profits, first of all, and secondly, to have cigarette brands that were comparable with international brands in both quality and price. And of course, the other goal was to change perception of Chinese brands um, to, as premium would have, were supposed to be a better quality. So some other globalization strategies include um, expansion of cigarette exports. Exports in China have been taking place since the um, 80s. And the, the number really went up um, in fol following 2000s. Um, first of all, the, the ex exports were done through the China, China Tobacco Import Export Group, which was uh, eventually restructured to uh, and renamed to become China Tobacco International. They are supposed to act as a parent company of all Chinese operations overseas. Um, and another uh, globalization strategy is access to foreign technology and know-how. So um, these are really early attempts of the transnational tobacco companies to enter into China. So this was done through licensed production. For example, when uh, R.J. Reynolds licensed its production of camel cigarettes to a shaman cigarette factory. factory. Um, and secondly, there's also joint ventures and joint brand development. Same same as before, R.J. Reynolds, uh, with the same shaman factory, they have a joint brand called uh, Golden Bridge, which, was, which became pretty successful. Um, so for TTCs, this was a way to enter the Chinese market. But as uh, in the words of a Philip Morris executive, and I quote him, um, CNTC only wants to acquire foreign technology and management skills without giving away much to foreigners. So for China, this was an opportunity to gain better technology, better knowledge, and better management skills to eventually globalize. And lastly, China has been establishing foreign operations very actively. Um, in the 90s, this was really focused on the Asian region, region for example, in uh, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, and special economic zones, including Hong Kong and uh, Macau. 
following 2000s, um, this, the geographic reach really expanded. And there are now um, operations in Latin America, in the States, in Europe, in Africa. So overall, there are 34 operations across 20 countries and regions. And these span every single continent uh, apart from Australia. So now there are 14 branches operating in Asia, seven in Europe, seven in, America, in the um, Americas, including the United States, Mexico, and Latin America, and also three in Africa and three in the Middle East. So this really shows how uh, spread they are geographically. And uh, thirdly, there's also cooperations with the uh, TTCs. So this includes um, in joint, joint ventures, which uh, you'll hear about in the next presentation. And uh, this also, how, but I think the most alarming aspect is not that uh, China is cooperating with TTCs, it's that CNTC is now engaging in similar uh, things as it's mimicking TTCs. For example, it has its own licensed uh, brands to uh, Myanmar and to Mongolia, and also has joint brands with Myanmar and Mongolia. So in the words of a business analyst working for Euromonitor, um, the massive account surplus built over the years means that no company is too large to be purchased for cash. This was in response of uh, Hongtao Group in negotiations to purchase 0.05% share of Danskoi Tepak in Russia. And again, this was seen as an opportunity to enter a very, very big uh, cigarette market. So this is the map of uh, CNTC's overseas operations. All the red dots are uh, subsidiaries in operation at the time this paper was published. So how, is glo how globalized is CNTC to date? Well, we've, we see strong indicators that CNTC is poised to become a major global player. Um, they've consolidated, they've restructured for greater economies of scale. They now have market-specific uh, brand development. They target different brands based on the needs of each market. Um, they've increased exports to a diversified uh, a range of markets. And there's a wide geographic spread of overseas operations. And they have increased cooperations with the uh, TTCs. So what does this all mean? Well, because CNTC is so, the sheer size of it and the uh, uh, government policies which are supportive of the industry, um, this can have very, very big public health implications. For example, increased competition on the price, um, increased product marketing, increased number of new products will potentially increase uh, consumption of cigarettes worldwide. So we think next, um, really CNTC needs to be included in uh, global tobacco control efforts. But we also need more research on CNTC. It's mostly largely ignored in tobacco control research, uh, which still focuses on BAT, Philip Morris, Imperial Tobacco, et cetera, uh, especially because we're seeing strong evidence that TTC is mim mimicking strategies of, sorry, CNTC is mim mimicking strategies of TTCs in that it's trying to influence policy. Um, it's mimicking uh, their CSR strategies. So we need more research because this evidence is uh, still very limited. And that is all of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think the way we structure this session is the first two presentations are overviews of this issue, and we have three case studies that follow. So I would suggest you um, uh, hold your uh, overarching you know, questions to the very end, but I will still have time to allow one or more clarifying questions. Jean, is there a mic? I just wanted to ask that the, the map that you showed, the uh, production yep. in various countries, are those actually production or selling only? Are they actually producing cigarettes? Everything. And all these? Wow. Everything. And all of them. All of it, yeah. So okay. some are just offices, some are actual production facilities. Okay, so it is mixed. It's yeah, not, yeah, they're it's not producing everything. at every one of those. No, no, that's no, pretty. No. But that includes office and includes production uh, facilities. Okay, it might be interesting to see where they're actually producing because it's already scary. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> China is one of the countries which signed the WHO protocol mm -hmm. on illicit trade. Are they really thinking to ratify 
the protocol to eliminate uh, illicit trade? Because that would mean that they would have to mark all their products. Uh, do you think that will happen? It's a very good question. Um, we're also, as a research pro group, we're also interested in looking at uh, illicit trade. In we're, no, we're looking at it globally, but we're also very interested in looking at it um, from specifically in China and um, other places in Asia. Um, I can't say anything because we haven't done that research yet, <laughs> but maybe in the future. All right, thank you. Uh, I would suggest uh, to hold your question to the very end. We have some time for some general discussion at the end of the session. Uh, so I would like to introduce our second speaker, Gao Xing. Um, Gao Xing is from uh, McMaster University from the United States. And uh, uh, she was an intern at the Union this summer. And she did some wonderful research on this topic. So uh, Gao Xing's, uh, uh, the title of Gao Xing's talk is uh, History, Aims, and Aspirations of the Chinese Monopoly. Gao Xing. Um, hi guys, my name is Sting. I'm a student from McAllister College, um, and I'm going to be talking more about the internationalization activity of the uh, CNTC. So. So. Oh. Okay, um, so the China National Tobacco Corporation was established in 1981 to consolidate tobacco production and sale. It produces 40% of the world's supply of cigarettes and virtually dominates the domestic market in China. Recently, under China's going out policy, uh, the CNTC has been um, undergoing some activity to expand abroad. The second institution is the State Tobacco Monopoly Administration, also known as the STMA. This was established in 1983, and inside China, it sits on the FCTC implementation mechanism and has um, had a lot of policy interference in tobacco control policy in China. Another thing that the STMA does is that it regulates and manages the CNTC. One of the important tasks it uh, has is that it collects taxes, which generates about 8% of the national government revenue. Together, the CNTC and the STMA control the production chain of cigarettes, from tobacco growing to cigarette manufacturing to wholesale and retail. So there are four different internationalizing strategies I'm going to talk about. Some of these might overlap with the last presentation, but I'll go into a little more detail on the others. The first one is exporting tobacco, uh, and the bulk of what they export is cigarettes. So uh, in 2014, the CNTC exported uh, $572 million worth of cigarettes. Uh, some of the other stuff they, they export into tobacco leaves, tobacco byproduct, and pipe tobacco. This is a map showing uh, each particular country and how many percentage of uh, CNTC export that we receive. Um, China's highlighted in yellow and everything else is in pink uh, that receive a portion of the CNTC export. The lighter shades show, that, uh, show the country that receive up to 1% of CNTC export and that includes countries like Russia, Mongolia, India, some of the Southern African countries and the United States. The second shade, the medium pink, shows countries that receive between 1% to 10% of CNTC export, and that includes the Middle East, Middle East uh, Australia, Central Europe, and Canada. And the last one shows uh, countries that receive between 10 to 23% of CNTC export, and that uh, focuses on Southeast Asia. And so some of the top destinations of CNTC export include Hong Kong, at 20%, followed by Indonesia, Belgium, the UAE, and Malaysia. And I think this map primarily shows that uh, the CNTC has export in a lot of different markets, and they kind of do follow a regional pattern. Uh, in North America, in the uh, Central Europe, Middle East, Southern Africa, and maybe um, the uh, Southeast Asia. And the second strategy is uh, importing tobacco, and those are usually raw tobacco leaves from other countries. One of the questions that comes up is why is China importing more tobacco leaves? So in 2004, under the World Trade Organization, the import duty for tobacco dropped from 40% to 10%, which has facilitated the uptake of tobacco import. And recently, because of the consolidation effort, um, CNTC is looking to produce better quality cigarettes, and the importing tobacco is part of that. Uh, this map shows uh, the percentage each country receives from, uh, each country produces for CNTC import. 
Uh, the lightest shade uh, is about up to 1%, and followed by the second one is between 1 to 10, and then followed by 10 to 20%, and then the darkest one is 20 to 30%. Some of the top sources of CNTC input in Zimbabwe are 21.9%, followed by Brazil, United States, Hong Kong, and Zambia. And it's worth noting that both of these input and export map put together, China has a lot of uh, different relationship with many different countries in the world, cover almost all of the regions around the globe. Uh, I said we will look at a case study in Zimbabwe, which is a top source of CNTC import, uh, just to talk about a, a little bit about what has taken place there. So uh, tobacco contributes to about 45% of Zimbabwe's agriculture export. It makes up about 14 to 18% of that country's GDP, so it's a very important part of Zimbabwean economy. In 1998, Zimbabwe adopted agricultural reform, and this reform took land from larger scale commercial white farmers to smaller indigenous farmers. This had prompted an economic sanction from the West, and in response, Zimbabwe turned to China as an alternative trading partner. One of the things that was really appealing about China foreign policy is that it has a non-interference policy, uh, which was appealing to Zimbabwe after what had taken place in, with their relationship in the West. And then so Tianzhu, which is a 100% subsidiary of the CNTC and connected to the Vietnam province, uh, hold a very prominent role in Zimbabwe's tobacco sector. The two primary activities it conducts is the first one is through contract farming, and the second one is the purchase of the country's crop on the auction floor. Um, this partnership has been cited as a win-win situation because um, China has been credited with a high price of crop in Zimbabwe. Uh, they do provide a lot of technical assistance. And another thing was in this quote that Tianzhu had brought in capital, competition, confidence, and increased prices. The Chinese came when the industry was dying. And this kind of alluded to the decreased demand of tobacco in the West and how China had filled in that blend for them. Uh, the third strategy I'm going to be talking about is international partnership between uh, the CNTC and other transnational tobacco company, also known as the TDCs. CNTC hope to expand abroad while transnational companies hope to enter the cigarette market in China. Um, this is also partly due to the anti-tobacco policies uh, restricting TDCs in the West, so they're looking for other markets, and China obviously has one of the biggest cigarette markets in the world. And China is hoping to draw on TDC's expertise and resources in its attempt to uh, further expand abroad. Some examples of cooperation between the three largest TDC and CNTC is selling each other's brands, and this, this means that um, China will sell other foreign brands inside China uh, in exchange for other TDC introducing Chinese brand abroad. Uh, there are also other forms of technical assistance, and the last one is establishing joint ventures together. So some of the case studies looking at the three biggest uh, TDCs, and the first one is British American Tobacco. So British American Tobacco brand has uh, as the uh, state expats 555 can't let him turn down being sold in China. In exchange, the uh, British American Tobacco promotes the Chinese brand Shanxi abroad. In 2015, they established STBAT, which is a joint venture that's located in Hong Kong's Special Economic Zone. The second one is Philip Morris Tobacco, and since 1994, the brand Marlboro has been promoted and sold in China. In exchange, Philip Morris Tobacco promotes uh, Red Gold Dragon, Dubris, and Harmony, and those are uh, divided into three different price segments uh, with, with a low, medium, and premium price segment, and uh, really aimed at uh, market in Latin America, uh, Middle East, and Central Europe. In 2006, they established uh, CTPM in Switzerland, and 2012, they also established uh, uh, CTPMI in the DRC. The last one is ja Japan Tobacco International, and uh, Japan, uh, the brands that are sold in China are actually My7 and My7 Light, and Japan promotes uh, Zhonghua, Double Happiness, and Golden Deer inside of Japan. They do not have a joint venture together of state. Uh, so some other type of partnership is that um, BAT would promote technical assistance to tobacco production inside of China. Uh, they establish tobacco planting cooperation in Yunnan and Sichuan, um, PMI also introduced technology, training, and human resources expertise to CNTC factories. 
And the last strategy I'm going to be talking about is establishing tobacco companies and factories abroad. Regional tobacco companies under the CNTC have established operations abroad in many different countries, as was shown in the last, um, last, mm, last presentation. And sometimes they will partner with a local company, sometimes they will partner with the local government, and other times with transnational tobacco companies. The mission of this uh, joint venture is to produce and promote Chinese brand cigarettes abroad, develop and produce local brand cigarettes that are tailored to the local countries, and also to expand to neighboring countries and regions. Uh, so looking at a case study, uh, which is China Tobacco International Europe Company as an hour in Romania, uh, this was established in 2008 with an annual yield capacity of 3 billion cigarettes. They export product to Iraq, Ukraine, Tunisia, Libya, Moldova, and other countries. In 2013, the CTIEC founded the International Development Department, and now they aim to expand market in Central and Eastern Europe, Middle East, and Africa. The goal is that in 2016, they will be undergoing factory expansion or relocations, increasing production quality. The 2018 goal is to produce 10 billion cigarettes a year and generate $8 million revenue. Note that right now they only produce about 3 billion cigarettes a year, so that's quite an ambitious goal for 2018. Uh, there hasn't been much evidence on CNTC policy interference, so I thought I might offer a couple of hypotheses about how this might take place. So on the one hand, um, CNTC might attempt to influence tobacco control policy where there's a market for Chinese produced cigarettes. Um, especially if domestic tobacco laws are implemented well in China, which hopefully will lead to a decrease for demand in tobacco inside of China, and then CNTC will probably look for a market outside of China. And the second uh, way this might go is that the CNTC might attempt to influence agricultural tobacco policies in countries that the CNTC imports from. Uh, for example, is that in Zimbabwe there's been contract farming, right? So. The CNTC would definitely prefer policy that might favor this sort of agricultural policy. And I think it's worth noting that the CNTC has had a very long history of policy interference inside of China, and I feel this kind of expertise might be uh, well adopted to interfere with other countries' uh, tobacco control policy as well. So that's all for the presentation I have. Thank you very much. Clarifying questions from the audience. Up here. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the presentation. Now, it's my honor to introduce the next speaker, uh, Tanya Cavalcante from Brazil. She has been in tobacco control for so long that she's also known as the face of tobacco control in <laughs> Brazil. <laughs> And she heads the F WHO FCTC uh, treaty implementation in Brazil. Uh, it would be, this is not yours? No, it's not me, it's Eduardo. That, that's Eduardo's. <laughs> can we go on to the next one, please? But if you want, we can talk about it. No. <laughs> <laughs> can you pull out the uh, next one? It says Tanya. I knew the countries in Latin America cooperated with each other on tobacco control, but that I didn't think they switched the presentations as well. <laughs> so now we are here. So it's over to you, Tanya. Thank you uh, very much for inviting me to share our concern on these aspects of China in Brazil. Uh, I've, I'm very amazed with the presentations, two big pieces of uh, the same puzzle that we are trying to understand in, in Brazil. Um, can you pass the next one? Or, oh, okay, sorry. Here, here, no, okay. Uh, just a, a very fast context of Brazil. Uh, Brazil is a member state of WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control since 2005. It's the third tobacco producer and the largest tobacco exporter. Uh, and tobacco control policy is always under the strong pressure from tobacco supply chi uh, chain. This is a general picture that I'd like to share with you. 
Uh, <clears throat> it's important to, to have in mind that FCTC is a public health treaty that encompasses a comprehensive range of multisectorial evidence-based measures aimed to reduce tobacco use and exposure to tobacco. And, but by the other hand, it also recognizes the need to promote economically viable alternatives to tobacco production as a way to prevent possible adverse social and economic impacts on populations whose, li whose livelihoods depend on tobacco production. This is the principle of the article, FCTC Article 17. <clears throat> and uh, the last COP, it was approved a policy option and recommendations adopted by the COP uh, regarding how is the best practice, what are the best practices to implement Article 17 in the tobacco producer countries, for that's the case of Brazil. Uh, my, my presentation in general, I, I, I have two, uh, two big uh, pieces of this puzzle. The bright side of the scene that how is Brazil implementing FCTC status and results very briefly and how tobacco industry uh, always interfere, the tobacco supply chain, and the dark side of the scene. Brazil is a tobacco producer and how is the the management of the tobacco supply chain in Brazil, including China mono monopoly, and tobacco production harm, how tobacco production harms growers and the tobacco control policies, and the uh, final reflection on the importance of implementing Article 17. In Brazil, we have we uh, we accomplish uh, we accomplish the uh, multi-sectoral mechanism for coordination for coordinating the national the implementation of the FCTC. We have a national commission, a multi-sectoral uh, mechanism for implementing FCTC. We have different 18 uh, sectors of the federal government sharing the responsibility with FCTC obligations. These are the the sectors. We have the Ministry of Health chair. This, this commission and uh, we from National Cancer Institute, we are the co-chair. Uh, we are the co-chair and as well the executive secretariat. We have uh, a, a, a tax and price policy in Brazil, uh, uh, it's a FCTC Article 6 obligation. Uh, we have a minimal price cigarette policy. This policy is always being questioned and uh, pressured against by tobacco supply chain. So this is uh, the main argument is that the policies, all policies from FCTC uh, will cause damage in the tobacco growers livelihood. This is a mantra that we always hear for every tobacco control measure that we try to implement in Brazil. Uh, so this is, we have a total ban of tobacco advertising, FCTC Article 17, the same mantra tobacco, this measure will hurt uh, the livelihoods of tobacco growers, health warnings with photos in tobacco products. We have a 100% smoke-free legislation, and we have tobacco product regulation that includes ban of additives and flavors in tobacco product, but that is still under litigation from the tobacco industry uh, under the Supreme Court. We have also the implementation of uh, treatment for uh, the Article 14, treatment, uh, free treatment for smoking cessation, public health system. This is the, the monitoring of the whole process. This is increasing uh, the access. And we have a very uh, important decrease in smoking prevalence in 1989. We had 34% of smokers in the population of 18 years old. And in 2013, the last uh, uh, survey in the national wide we had 14.7, uh, uh, the prevalence. The other side of the, the, the same coin, we have uh, uh, Brazil is, a tobacco, is the third producer and the large exporter, and 85% of tobacco production is exported. This is a very important uh, aspect that we use to highlight. Uh, we have a, a very strong decline in the tobacco consumption in, in domestic market, but uh, so our, most of our production goes ab abroad. In China, uh, it's uh, agreeing with what, what being said, is the leading tobacco, leading tobacco buyer uh, uh, from Brazil. And is, this is a, a report, uh, the magazine report of tobacco industry, and it's preparing the way for expanding even, even further. 
So China is the, the it was uh, the, the um, it was not so much in 2010, but in 2011 it uh, uh, passed uh, the the level of uh, importation from Belgium. The three states from South region account for 97 percent of production. Uh, you can see the last one state is Rio Grande do Sul state is the 50% uh, of the tobacco production in Brazil. This is, keep in mind, Rio Grande do Sul state that's uh, a very important uh, state that interferes in tobacco control policy. And, and we have a small uh, production, small amount in, in some states from northeast in Brazil. Uh, we have near 700 municipalities depending almost exclusively from tobacco production in our country, economically. And we have uh, near 150,000 fam farming families that are incorporated by this, the, the, the big tobacco transnational that are working in Brazil for controlling the whole tobacco supply chain. I'm sorry. Uh, so we here, this is a, a, a source from the, the Union of Tobacco Industry of Brazil. Uh, they have here 14 transnational tobacco companies that control the whole supply chain and engage 150,000 small farmers and their families. And um, more recently, we have China, this is the 15th uh, company that uh, went to the mar in the market in Brazil uh, around uh, 2000, 2012. So this is a, a piece of uh, um, uh, report from this uh, union of tobacco industry that says China Tobacco International from Brazil, subsidiary of the state corporation China Tobacco International signed an agreement with Alliance, Alliance One Brazil. Alliance One is one of the biggest company that produce, that uh, prepare the whole, the, the, the leaves in Brazil. They don't, uh, um, uh, produce cigarettes, but they prepare the leaves for exportation. So to create a new company exclusively focused on the shipment of premium tobaccos from Brazil to China. So it make, makes sense what, on what has been said here in the, first, the previous presentation. Um, China Tobacco International of Brazil plans to invest $2,000 million in 2015. This is a, a past uh, uh, report in joint venture with China Brazil tobacco exporter. Because now we have a company, a Brazilian chi China tobacco company. And now China is investing in this company in the Brazilian state of Rio Grande do Sul, that, that one that I showed you, that's the south part of Brazil. Um, so uh, the, this China International Tobacco of Brazil was created in 2012 in partnership with U.S. Com company Alliance One Exportadora de Tabacos. It's important to, to understand that tobacco growers in Brazil is, uh, cause a lot of damage for the growers, for the environment. So we have many denunciation from public prosecutors from several NGOs showing the def deforestation, the child labor that are uh, part of this process of tobacco producers. We have, uh, for example, children up to five years working in tobacco farming in Paraná State, for example. During the school holidays, they work with tobacco leaves all day long. During tobacco harvest, they, their body absorbs a large amount of nicotine. This is the green leaf disease. So this is the, the other side of the, the problem. So we have uh, some publications on the, the green tobacco sickness and pesticides poisoning as well, and child low labor. This is a part of the Article 18 of FCTC Article 18. Uh, we have also the, another very important damage for tobacco growers. We have, uh, they face difficulties in negotiation of the tobacco price with companies. They are always in debt with this all tobacco companies, including uh, China. China also, they, uh, they uh, um, hired uh, 
some growers to produce for them. Unfortunately, I didn't uh, bring this data, but we have some data that they are always, always uh, as well controlling some growers to uh, produce for, for exportation in this China monopoly. And here, just a little for how tobacco supply chain interfere in tobacco control policy in Brazil. So we have, for example, for Brazil, to ratify FCTC, we have a strong opposition coming from the tobacco supply chain. They use, uh, when, I, when I say tobacco supply chain, I, I mean that the tobacco companies, some policymakers, and every uh, people that are engaged in this process of producing tobacco in Brazil. So we had to face a strong opposition to have several public hearings in tobacco uh, growing regions, and they used to say that if Brazil would ratify FCTC, we would bring the economical chaos. So this is one of the, the more emblematic way, modus operandi of the tobacco supply chain in Brazil. Uh, here we have uh, another example in Uruguay in 2010, FCTC COPS uh, COP4. We have strong oppositions from the representatives of tobacco chain in Brazil against the approval of the guidelines that would uh, prohibit the banning the additives in, in cigarettes and other tobacco products. So here we have a, a, a picture on this issue. Uh, in FCTC COP5, we have a very huge delegation from tobacco industry pressuring the official delegation of Brazil, and they, uh, they, the, they are, here is uh, something that was published by the, 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 the Chamber of uh, Legislators in Rio Grande do Sul, uh, where legislators from tobacco producer states ask for support of the Ministry of Agri Agriculture to interfere against the position of ANVISA, it's the National Health Surveillance that is responsible for tobacco regulation in Brazil, Minus of Health and the National Commission for FCTC Implementation. Um, here we have another example how tobacco supply chain made a mobilization against tobacco additive ban in Brazil. By manipulating information to tobacco growers, tobacco industry gathered more than 200,000 forms expressing opposition on the proposal on visa to ban additives. And the argument that the measure will cause severe social and economic harms. This process uh, postponed the, the, the prohibition for more than a year because Anvisa has to, to, to consider all these, these forms. And uh, we have also litigation. Now this, this ban is under litigation on support Supreme Court. This is another modus operandi of the tobacco supply chain. And very important to highlight that many of the politicians are financed by these companies. So here we have uh, the case of one of the federal deputies that he's from the, the, the state of Rio Grande do Sul, but he operates in the National Congress. And he, he was the author of a bill of law to cancel the visa measure that prohibited tobacco companies to use flavors and other activities in tobacco products. So, uh, he was financed by Philip Morris, that one of the companies that integrate the whole tobacco supply chain, one of the 14 that I presented. Here we have another federal deputy from Rio Grande do Sul State again, and he was financed by Philip Morris and by China Tobacco Exporter in Brazil, Exportadora. So uh, we can see here that it's a way of uh, tobacco industry try to uh, interfere in tobacco control policies by financing these legislators that go uh, in the cabinets of the, the minister of, of different ministers of Brazil to try to push down the, all the tobacco control measure in Brazil. And this deputy is one of the more aggressive deputies that is trying to push some representative of tobacco industry in the Brazilian delegation that will be in COP7. So we are suffering strong pressure from this uh, deputy. And more than 4,000, this is a, one example of how this deputy that's financed by Philip Morris and China Tobacco is, operates uh, to 
tried to push down on tobacco control policy in Brazil. So this is uh, uh, more than 4,000 people among tobacco producers, workers in tobacco supply chain, participate in the public hearing organized by Agriculture Commission of Deputy Chambers in Rio Grande do Sul. In this event proposed by this deputy, federal, states, federal and state legislators and mayors, so they, they, they have an, uh, an army of policymakers and legislators, uh, signed the manifesto repudiating the new restriction to tobacco by national sanitary surveillance uh, visa. This is another example, a senator of Brazil that is in the, the report of tobacco industry and saying that uh, the, the Anvisa is a problem for tobacco production. So I, I'd like to bring you a reflection. Is alternative to tobacco growing, FCTC Article 17, a way to reduce tobacco industry power to interfere in tobacco control policy? It's important to, to keep this in mind because Article 17 is always considered very perif peripheral obligations under FCTC. We have always to fight to put this in the, in the agenda and to have financial support from COP. In our view, it's important to consider that uh, tobacco supply chain uh, is controlled by this, all these companies and they control the com consumption side and the production side. This is a systemic view. We have to, have to bear in mind that we have to view that these two sides, they have connections. One side, the tobacco industry, they try to target adolescents and children to transform them in smokers in independence of tobacco dependence and to expand the consumption. The other side, they seduced small farmers saying that producing tobacco will bring them to the welfare, to, to, to be more rich people and then they produce depend, economic dependence. And this guarantees the product expansion because they have these growers in their hand. They use these growers as mass of maneuver to interfere in tobacco control policy. And they use these growers as a way to reduce the, like a pressure valve to reduce the impact of economic impact because when the, 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 we increase the tax, pass this increase of tax on cigarettes to the, the amount they pay for the tobacco growers. So we, we, can, we have to connect the, the both sides we, we both side to understand a more systemic uh, way, this process. So we have, uh, when they control the tobacco supply chain, they are guaranteed the low cost of production and the low price of tobacco products. It's very important to, to the expansion of the consumption. And mainly, they are uh, creating a way of a power to interfere economically and politically in, in the, these regions and to interfere in tobacco control policy. So this is a cycle. We should see this as a very systemic way of seeing this, this relationship. So uh, just to uh, finish, we'd like just to, to understand that tobacco growers are as victims of tobacco industry as are the smokers. They need support to quit growing tobacco as the smokers need to quit smoking. The implementation of, of, of Article 17 and 18 is a way to reduce tobacco industry power to interfere in tobacco control policy. The implementation of Article 17 and 18 should be protected from vested interests of tobacco industry because in Brazil, we have a national tobacco control uh, uh, program for diversification in tobacco growing air areas, but tobacco industry create their own program of diversification. It grows uh, beans and corn between the tobacco crops. This is the way they are trying to preempt this uh, process of diversification. In face of a global decrease of tobacco demand that we, we are seeing with the, the FCTC reports, we can see that the, the, there is signs of reduction of, of the consumption. Tobacco uh, grower producers, countries need to speed up the implementation of pol policy option recommendation to FCTC Article 17 and 18 as a way to safeguard tobacco growers' livelihood. So we have this program of diversification that uh, started in 2005. 
and sorry and now uh, this is the the picture of how is the implementation of this program it's very difficult because we have many interference from tobacco industry many resistance but it's very slowly slowly very slow it's going ahead but it's very difficult because so this is the the main okay thank you this is Thank you, Tanya. We will just take one question, if it's a clarifying question, because we'll want to hear from the other countries as well uh, before we open the floor for discussions. Marika, you had a question? a certain portion of the country that is really tobacco growing and where the tobacco industry also uh, mobilized the uh, legislators coming from this area, the local chief executives, to go against tobacco control. Now, um, I am also happy that you took note of the fact that uh, the, uh, as far as the problem on tobacco growing, it is really a systemic uh, manifestation and that uh, we have to learn that uh, uh, that particularly for uh, developing country like the Philippines, the tobacco industry has been so-called helping the tobacco farmers uh, in their tobacco farming to the extent that they give out loans. You know, for, uh, and um, they are the ones also buying the, uh, the produce of the tobacco farmers. But uh, in the end, the tobacco farmers actually feel that uh, all through the process of from tobacco farming to the, uh, f to the processing no, and up to the production, everything is actually being, they are actually assisted all the way. They don't have to put out money. Yeah? And that is something that we probably need to always bear in mind, that if we will, if alternative livelihood is going to be uh, successful, it has to actually copy what the tobacco industry are doing, not to the tobacco farmers. Because if there is no assistance all the way from beginning to end, then I think alternative livelihood will just be probably uh, something that tobacco farmers will do uh, in between tobacco farming. So it's Thanks, not- Thanks, Marika. I think- I, I, Yeah, so I, uh, I think we need to probably um, think of it in that way. I don't know if that is actually what you are also doing in Brazil. Assistance, what type of assistance is being given to the farmers? I'll request Tanya to hold on to that answer till the end because ah, okay. we still have two presentations, two presentations to go. Yeah, and you. your question might be answered by the next presenter. At the end, thanks, Tanya. So our next presenter is a very dear friend of ours who we have worked together for a long time. I would request uh, Eduardo uh, to do the next presentation. He is the chair of uh, everything which happens in Uruguay. <laughs> and he's the Tobacco Epidemic Research Center. And at a time, you may not believe it, both Eduardo and I were young <laughs> when the FCTC negotiations started. And all the big experts in tobacco control assigned us to a night shift. And both Eduardo and I used to do photocopying at 2 AM in the morning at the UICC office to distribute materials the next day. Eduardo has, still has the energy to do that right now. And he's still going strong with all his successes in Uruguay and the court cases which are brought against that country. So we'll be listening from Eduardo on the impact of the Chinese monopoly on tobacco control in Uruguay. Eduardo. Thank you, Ethan. Thanks to the union and the organizers of this session for the invitation. Um, I need to confess when I was tasked to speak on, that, on this topic, I did not have much information about that. So it was a challenge. It is a challenge for me to talk about this, this uh, topic. Um, I have no conflict of interest on this, that topic. 
And the main uh, objective for this talk will be first setting the context. I will brief, uh, briefly talk about China and Latin American countries, uh, how they have been uh, interacting and, and making business in the last two decades, and what has been the, been the impact of uh, this interaction, and how important is China for Latin American governments. And uh, then we are to, to talk about uh, on the international CNCT, CNTC strategy and provide some examples on uh, how it could be working in uh, the Latin American region. And for doing that, I mainly use two sources of, of information. First, a non-systematic search you know, on the internet I, I, I made and a brief survey I conducted based on interviews uh, to uh, tobacco control advocates and experts from 14 Latin American countries, and then finally provide some conclusions. From my search of, on internet, I will share a couple of uh, media articles that provide uh, you a picture on the importance of Latin America for China. One from China Daily in 2004 highlighted that Latin America at the time was the fastest growing region for China's investment worldwide. More recently, um, another article from BBC World stated that for China, Latin America, it is important uh, mainly for two reasons. First, because of his natural resources and, and raw materials, and second, for establishing joint companies to work on these raw materials in a moment where the cost of work workforce in China is increasing. For this reason, we could understand why China created a 10,000 million US dollar investment fund for cooperating with Latin American countries. And this trade relationship has had impact on the whole region, but mostly in some countries. As you can see on the left, uh, between 2002 and 2008, countries as Chile, Peru, Argentina, Costa Rica increased significantly their export to China. And on the right, you can see how that trend continued growing after 2008, and how some countries like Costa Rica and my country, Uruguay, increased their export to China 500 or 600 percent in the last few years. But what has been the impact of this trade relationship? Politicians expected that trade could increase uh, the revenues and the number of uh, jobs at the country level. But some researchers uh, have put in doubt the benefits of this relationship. They insist that China investments are mainly focused in extractive industries and in agriculture in order to get raw materials, but little on the manufacturing uh, industry. They also say that the number of jobs created by China's investment are less than from other kind of investment, and in fact, they have been decreasing along the years. And worryingly, that Chinese investment has had more negative impact on the environment than other kind of, of investment. Now, going to the point, this is China uh, National Tobacco Company. I, I not to talk about that because uh, two speakers uh, is, uh, talk about that better than me, that I, I'm just learning about this topic. Um, uh, and we have already listened the, about the some characteristic of uh, the China National Tobacco Company and uh, his related uh, manufacturing and commercial enterprise. But uh, I, I will just highlight that China Tobacco Company, apparently what I got as information is they, they are they decided to 
expand their businesses worldwide. It, 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 the, 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 the other presenters have raised that topic, and, uh, and it is important for our region because what are the strategies they are using internationally, and what is the impact they could be uh, having in our region? From um, from um, uh, an, an article from researchers from the University of Waterloo to be published in short, the main international strategy for CNTC to expand their uh, businesses are first, securing the tobacco leaf supply. And we had the example from Brazil, but also from Cuba and from Dominican Republic. And, and listening to the other speaker, I ask myself, we have no much, no many countries growing tobacco and exporting tobacco. The main ones are Brazil, Argentina, Cuba, Dominican Republic, and correct me if there is probably Honduras and Nicaragua, but if you have the first four one, just Brazil with very difficult campaign, they could ratify FCTC. But Argentina, uh, Cuba, and Dominican Republic are not FCTC members up to the moment. Just thinking about this, this, the, this issue. And so the second point is penetrating in market um, uh, to, so they need to identify countries, if possible, with weak tobacco control policies to establish manufacturing facilities or acquire, acquiring local tobacco companies or making joint ventures. Clear example of that uh, are Argentina and Bolivia. In Argentina, the Junta Group established an alliance with a local tobacco company to produce and export Chinese cigarettes to the region. I will mention, keep, provide more information on that. If you look at the upper right, the Tobacco Asia magazine mentioned that Shanghai Tobacco is developing new market worldwide, and that in Latin America, they are focusing in Paraguay, which is the center of the tobacco illicit trade in Latin America, but also Chile, Argentina, Mexico, Peru, and Panama, as it was mentioned. Finally, the last strategy is cooperating with multinational tobacco companies like uh, Philip Morris and BAT. Regarding the last, this last strategy, as this article from Argentina highlights, because of the, the 2008 agreement between PMI and CNTC, and you can correct me because I read about that, but I, I'm not an expert on this kind of uh, agreement. Uh, PMI's Argentina subsidiary launched the, the Chinese brand Harmony in 2008. As I mentioned it before, in order to better understand the current sit regional situation on this topic, I conducted a brief survey that reached 14 of the 20 Latin American countries and included 17 interviews to people from Ministry of Health and civil, or, and civil Society. And you can see on the slide the name of the countries and the people that uh, participated. That survey showed that from 14 countries surveyed, 10 identified that Chinese cigarettes are sold in their market. The remaining four that say that Chinese cigarettes are not sold in their market are Brazil, that you you could see Brazil is an exported and have relationship with China, but apparently they are not selling a Chinese cigarette there. Uh, this is what a tobacco control advocate uh, told us. And, uh, and the other countries are Chile, Venezuela, and Uruguay. But you can see in the pictures, in, in the uh, presenters uh, at the very beginning, 
the Chile was marked as a country where China is uh, having apparently a relationship, trade relationship, but in Chile, there is no consumption of Chinese cigarettes. So we need to start thinking about what is happening with, this, with these things. Um, and Uruguay also uh, is not consuming uh, cigarette, uh, Chinese cigarettes. And the next question was, are they sold legal or illegal? And we, um, we have, the, the, uh, the, they reply in seven out of 10 that they are just sold illegally. In two of them, uh, that they are Bolivia and Peru, they are also uh, uh, sold legally. So you have legally and illegally a uh, cigarette. And in one country, the both interviewed uh, were, uh, said that they are sold just legally, that is Argentina. So in summary, Chinese cigarettes are part of the illegal cigarette market in nine to uh, out of 10 uh, uh, of the countries where Chinese cigarettes are sold in the countries that I could survey. We also asked them if they were Chinese tobacco company. Tobacco companies established at the country. Just three countries reply yes. Brazil, Bolivia, and Argentina. And in Brazil, as Tanya said, there is a joint venture Alliance One Brazil involving two companies, Chinese Tobacco International of Brazil and Chinese Brazil Tobacco Exporter, subsidiary of China Tobacco International. This is the information I have. As, I, uh, as it was mentioned, they will just export tobacco leaf and do not produce a cigarette to be sold in the local market. In Bolivia, the Honta Group and the Hong Yang Hong, I don't know if that is the, <laughs> the right pronunciation, group have agreement with local tobacco companies. In Argentina, as it was said, since 2008, CNTC has an agreement with PMI local subsidiary. Um, and we also, from our search on internet, I identify another Chinese tobacco company established in Panama and I, and I saw in your pictures uh, before that Panama is another, but this company d do not produce cigarettes to be sold, apparently, I'm not uh, totally uh, certain, in Panama, but to other regional uh, countries. And they apparently are selling and let me um, let me check. Okay, this is uh, what I want to to share with you uh, uh, from my internet um, search. You have the company in Panama, Overseas United, that uh, is related to China Hunan Tobacco. I don't know if if it H or. <laughs> but this is what in Latin America they, they name. And they produce uh, the brand Marshall that it, it is sold in Mexico and in Colombia illegally. And produce also mother that is sold illegally in Guatemala and produce silver elephant that is, sell, is, is sold illegally in Costa Rica. And we go to the south, we found the, uh, a company, joint venture company with, in, in Argentina, with a province uh, tobacco company, Honta Group, produced hems and brass brands. They publish it uh, in, in the media, they are exporting uh, these cigarettes to Uruguay and to Chile. And there is no Chinese cigarette consumption in Uruguay nor Chile. Where are these cigarettes <laughs> diverted? And uh, well, they are also sell cigarettes to, um, to Bolivia. 
uh, and in relation to, to the brands, and, I, and I ha I, I'm confused because I saw from the previous presenter uh, names, brand names that I don't know now if they are Chinese or Japanese, <laughs> because <laughs> Golden Deer is Chinese or Japanese? Eh? Okay, so I'm right, <laughs> because I, I understood wrongly what you say. I, I, I'm not talking about uh, the different kind of uh, brands you, you see here, but interestingly, there, there are some of them that probably are the original from China, but, but Cigar Mojito Cuban, you smoke, uh, the people smoke Cigar is a Mojito Cuban in China, or cigarette named Cumbia, in China, so apparently they are naming, putting names, Latin names to Chinese cigarette. Uh, so this is interesting for us, but they are adapting uh, their sales to, to the market. And what about the more important tobacco control policy, increasing tobacco taxes and prices? In, now, in night out of 10 countries surveyed our interviews said that Chinese cigarettes have low prices. Just Panama mentioned that Chinese cigarettes are also part of the premium market segment. Our internet search uh, identified that Harmony is a Chinese premium brand that is, has been sold in, in Argentina since 2008. So most of the Chinese cigarettes in our, in our uh, region are uh, low prices but apparently they are working on premium brands as well. And what's happened with tobacco advertising? Just one country, Peru, recognized that uh, tobacco is direct advertised, uh, uh, mainly here that you have the photo from the uh, Lima's uh, airport, the capital city of uh, Peru. But if you look at the internet, uh, in the case of Argentina, you have many uh, media articles uh, talking about the Chinese uh, cigarettes, a Chinese uh, uh, investment, um, and so you also have uh, internet uh, sales of cigarettes in Argentina, uh, is Argentina free market, Mercado Libre Argentina, are, um, so what do we know about other countries that we couldn't get direct information from uh, the tobacco control advocate? Honduras, Nicaragua, we got information that illicit trade, Chinese, illicit, uh, 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 um, Chinese cigarettes are being sold in the illicit market. And also we got information that uh, China is working with the Dominican Republic, a producer, and is the only country that even signed the FCTC. And obviously, they have a long relationship with, um, with Cuba. So, in conclusion, in spite of interesting tobacco control effort uh, that China government, China's government is, is uh, conducting, Apparently, they are committed to expand the tobacco, the China's tobacco industry worldwide. And the international strategy, uh, the China's international strategy, is having Im a negative impact in Latin, um, to, uh, Latin American tobacco control, promoting and sustaining tobacco illicit trade, eroding tobacco taxation policies as most of the cigarettes are very low prices, and they are promoting tobacco leaf growing af as they, <laughs> they have the source of uh, uh, tobacco leaf there, and so uh, the growers from Argentina, from Brazil, from Dominican Republic, from, from Cuba are interested in continuous selling because they, they, ha they, they have a big, uh, a big um, company buying the, their product. What what we don't know is one thing that I couldn't put here. What is China tobacco company doing in relation to misleading consumer? I couldn't identify if they are, they, I know that it, 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 they are international, they are using 
light miles and, 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 and a, this kind of presentation to mislead consumers. I don't know what is happening in Latin America. I don't know also if there are interference with tobacco control development and national level. And that and this topic are a matter of research in our region. So finally, the growing trade relationship and the influence that China is having on the region set a potential risk for Latin American tobacco control progress. And I'm very happy to be here and, and was tasked by the union to understand that topic that I had no information <laughs> before that. <laughs> Thanks to you. <laughs> Are there any questions from the audience for Eduardo? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation, Eduardo. So, yeah, yeah. It's my, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce our last speaker for the session today, uh, Dalda Adam. Dalda is uh, the uh, technical advisor uh, for the Union for Africa. He's really our um, uh, expert for the African region on tobacco control. So he's going to talk about uh, the same topic, CNTC's um, uh, trade and uh, other uh, policy interventions uh, in African countries. Okay, thank you <coughs> so much, uh, Gan. I would like to thank uh, the Tobacco Department to have initiated this uh, uh, symposium on this topic. As uh, told uh, uh, my friend uh, uh, Eduardo, so. For me also, it is a good challenge. I appreciate this, uh, uh, this invitation to do this work. I'm not a specialist uh, of, uh, on this topic, but it's very interesting. I, I learn more, so I, will, I, I, I would like to share with you what I have learned about uh, this topic about uh, China uh, cigarette uh, in, in Africa. So I, I, I'm going to just to give you a not a comprehensive uh, a situation of uh, uh, tobacco in uh, 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 chai, 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 monopoly of China in, in, in Africa, but it's only a, a, a never view of the situation. So firstly, uh, I will <coughs> tell you about the context of relationship between uh, um, uh, China and Africa, but the context is very important as uh, uh, reminded uh, Eduardo because political play is big role in uh, trade in Africa, in several countries, but particularly for in Africa. Uh, we, so only we will go to see what action in tobacco trade in, in Africa. And after we, we will uh, share some key message before to conclude. So in the context, so China is uh, the largest trading partner of Africa on to USA and the uh, European Union. So uh, country stability, corruption, and presence of other foreign investors in, are not factor in China decision about where to invest. China buy raw material and uh, sell to Africa, as in America, America Latin America. It is very cheap manufacturing goods such as textile, footwear, and consumer electronic, uh, machinery, uh, commercial electronic, and transportation equipment. So many things is very cheaper in Africa if you get it because China is present in in Africa. So about uh, trade in Africa. So trade between uh, China and Africa is growing. Uh, this last year, in estimating um, 30 per, per year, 30 percent per year, with raw commodity from Africa flowing out in the economic cooperation to build factories and infrastructure, uh, agriculture, uh, amenity, etc. So the exchanges are not uh, unequal for Africa, and is still strongly supported by China because. Uh, Two uh, thirty of African export to China are primary commodity, especially that uh, 
uh, extractive resources such as oil, uranium, aluminium, zinc phosphate, and also uh, tobacco. So that uh, one information I have, but for me, I as an expert in tobacco control, but I don't know, sir, uh, China is a bigger, bigger, uh, uh, have a big, bigger uh, producer uh, in, uh, in tobacco control, so more uh, more uh, other five uh, uh, um, uh, competitor combined. So we, I have learned also that uh, uh, China National Tobacco Corporation have reformed their import export system in 2007 and created the China National Tobacco International uh, Company to to in to to to, to increase uh, his exportation. So what is the situation in Africa? So I have uh, learned some example uh, in, in Africa. So one thing in strategy, so we know China a National Tobacco Corporation have expanded to the following countries in Africa. Many of them as they pro ha is uh, producing tobacco. We have Zimbabwe, we have Zambia, we have Malawi, we have Tanzania. Mm. All of them are producing tobacco. So I don't have more information about Mozambique. He also a good uh, a, a, a producing t tobacco. So uh, we have the presence of uh, Tianzi Tobacco. He is a, a subsidiary um, company of uh, CNCTC. Uh, one of present uh, speaker have told about this. He is very present in uh, in Zimbabwe and uh, have a, a, a look on some product from several countries in the region because some of many of the countries Zimbabwe, Zambia, Malawi are all in South Africa. Yes, you know. So we have the example of Zimbabwe. So Zimbabwe is a larger producer of tobacco uh, left in Africa and uh, the world for after. Uh, uh, United States, Brazil, and China. China now remains the biggest tobacco export destination of Zimbabwe. Uh, China helped Zimbabwe uh, process its uh, tobacco in the cigarette in preparation for to for export. In in, the, in Zimbabwe also, so Chinese companies, as I told Tianzi, so helping many farmer to to develop uh, tobacco control. So, to help to increase price for uh, farmers, that one example. So I I have learned also in the Malawi. So we have one example of China's Sinoma, he, a Chinese company. He he licensed and had already invested uh, thir thirty million dollar to purchase tobacco and uh, set up a plant for process processing a smokeless cigarette. So we have in Tanzania also some discussion is ongoing to how to facilitate uh, um, an investment uh, uh, on tobacco uh, uh, in uh, uh, to develop cigarette manufacturing in the Tabora, uh, which is a region sub region of uh, of, uh, of uh, Tanzania. We have in Zambia so a new tobacco factory is being constructed uh, in the music facility trade zone. The, in the outskirts of the capital, Lusaka. So that means that tobacco will benefit all uh, a free taxation for five years. So, <coughs> so that can this 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 strategy will help to get uh, a cheaper price of cigarette in this region. It is a country Zambia. So we have in francophone country. I requested, I contacted many of uh, focal points, but some of them don't, don't have more information. But I know that in Congo Brazza, in Mauritania, and recently in Chad, there are uh, some uh, uh, <coughs> cigarettes from uh, China who will start to introduce in this region also. So what's the key message? So I have two key messages. Two, firstly, the, for me, China is the largest trading financial and technical partner in Africa, without uh, 
its industrial investment in agriculture and the importance of trade, as I told in the first part. So Gon leaders, China National Tobacco Corporation, invest in the development to, of tobacco growing in Africa and contribute to increasing the supply of tobacco. For me, that is a, an obstacle for the implementation of FCTC, uh, in general of, for the Article uh, uh, 17 and, uh, and Article 6, because we have in uh, uh, South Africa region example of China uh, is um, invested to increase the <coughs> tobacco product. And we have some countries, as example of Zambia, can help to, 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 to produce tobacco uh, without uh, at free tax. So, certainly, so China is seen in Africa as a new development donor. That's the visibility that China have in Africa. Because now many countries don't ha are in the sit crazy situation. So China now is the partner, the donor, who is invest finance several activities in our country, provide money to the government, provide any anything. So we have in Africa the lapse of governments that is good to go one the challenge. Corruption is present. So yeah, many of countries have about problem issues about the stability. For China, it is not, it is not the factor. So we are, I'm very afraid because when I look all this opportunity China have in Africa, <coughs> so we, 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 we need to move to do something. For me, in conclusion, so you know, so Africa, the population of Africa grow, continue to rise in Africa. It is expected to quadruple by the end of the century. China is a poor economic and financial in the region. His investment in Africa may be uh, the consequence for tobacco control in the left on check it. It is important uh, to step at to the adv advocacy at the regional, sub-regional, and also national level in Africa for a better understanding of uh, uh, WHO, FCTC, and the cooperation and trade agreement. Because most of political, most of key makers don't have more information about FCTC, about many agreements. So, Many of agreement have been seen during the big meeting or summit where the president have attended, and uh, after we are manage the consequence. So we need, for me, we need to have uh, to initiate a, a research because there are not more information. If you are checking in internet or look uh, other, there are not more main information about this topic. For me, it is a new topic. We need to have the research for more details and for the best recommendation for action. Thank you. Thank you, Devda, uh, for the present. Before I open the floor for discussion, I would just like to recognize two personalities in this room. Uh, one is our dear friend, Lou Cousins who is a global authority on the movement of these tobacco products across the globe, especially Europe. And thank you for joining us today. And the other one is Mr. our dear friend John Cavito from Malawi. John, if you can raise your hand. John has been in the forefront of uh, illicit tobacco, tobacco growing, movement of tobacco leaf in Africa. So I'm really glad that both these gentlemen are here who can really help us to think through as this is a new topic on what, what the different strategies can be. And please, if you have time, go and talk to them and all the other presenters. Now I'll quickly open the floor for a few questions. We have time for a couple. Uh, Tanya still needs to answer what Marikar, so we'll start with Tanya uh, for the answer what Marikar was asking for. Uh, can we have the mic, please? Thanks. Here. 
it's, um, it's very important, the, the issue that you raised, uh, Marita. Uh, one very important aspect of the diversification program in Brazil is that there is a frame of um, measures. It's, uh, first, it is part of the national program of agrarian development. It's not only for tobacco, it's for everything. And this, there are several components of this frame. One of them is resort to understand what's the better production, uh, cooperativism, uh, and capacity building, because tobacco growers are specialized in growing tobacco. They don't know to do any, anything more, generation for generation producing tobacco. And also guarantee the, the putting the, pro the new product in the market. So we have several components that are put together on this. Uh, I, I don't know if, uh, if, if I, I attend your, if it's also loan for, for tobacco growing or for tobacco yeah, diversification. diversification. Yeah, uh, in this national uh, tobacco program, f uh, sorry, <laughs> is the national program of diversification is part, as part of the national program of uh, agrarian development, there is a kind of, uh, um, a loan called uh, uh, for for enhancing family farming. So this uh, there there is th this uh, th this new uh, tobacco uh, these tobacco growers that are diversifying they can access this money. But what happened in the past? It's very important to highlight, and this is maybe why China is so interesting in Brazil, is that this loan was as well assessed for tobacco production. So tobacco companies used to, to, to assess this loan uh, in the bank and pass for the growers without the benefits of the, the low taxes. And then in 2003, it was prohibited to, for to, uh, to use this loan for tobacco production. So, but there is a strong pressure from tobacco companies to revert this measure. And they succeed to have another kind of subsides. So uh, this is the National Bank of Development that has uh, uh, loans with low, uh, low, how do you say? Interest rates, low interest. No, low, invest, no, not low, low taxes yeah. to pay. And uh, so when they prohibited uh, the, the use of this uh, national uh, program of family farming, the loans for this, for tobacco industry, they immediately uh, went to this other way of uh, having subsides with uh, public money. So my hypothesis is that China is as well very interested because all these companies can access this money in Brazil to invest in tobacco growth. So this is a way to put the, the production very low. So this is one of the hypotheses. We, ha we have other, but uh, for now, I just raise, raise this. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Look. Um, I was this year in Zimbabwe, and I was so impressed by the presence of China in Zimbabwe. So they are looking really to countries with raw materials, such as Brazil, Zimbabwe. But the comment which I, I think the presentations today were excellent, but in, if you see from the different presentations, the, um, the link with illicit trade and low price brands is also striking. For instance, in Romania, they were exporting to Iraq, Libya, Moldova, Ukraine. These are countries where you know that uh, it could be the illegal market. What we heard from Eduardo um, and what we heard from the other day in, in Africa, the, the link to the illicit trade, we should look at the Chinese brand and uh, illicit trade. That's a comment. I think, uh, look, going back to your first question about China's ratification of the protocol, um, I think from the perspective of protecting the domestic market, China, uh, I'm sure China absolutely supports the protocol. But from the international market, uh, I wouldn't be surprised that China Tobacco is behind of some of the smuggling activities. So that might be the reason why 
China hasn't ratified. I'm not sure, but just a guess. Well, we need to finish. Yeah, uh, we're running out of time, so a uh, last uh, comment. Well, uh, this is uh, a question regarding the, the African experience. Uh, Dada has very good, uh, presented very well. I have a curiosity to know about the uh, some sort of activity because this, these are the efforts which uh, are basically the two companies are having to the deep rooted in the society also. So some sort of activity like the CSR or something, they do, do they have uh, also partnering with the companies which are with the African companies, the Chinese companies? Did you get my answer, uh, question? Yeah. Can, I, can I request that the next session is about to start and we are already seven minutes over. Okay. So we need to leave the room. So if we can have, I know these are very important discussions, but if we can have continue this in the corridor as well, and please do come up and ask the questions. I'm really sorry, but the next uh, session is here. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you, thank you.